Just like. And yeah, she's on there. Right, there we go. Awesome. <clears throat> right, you'll be yourself. Nice. Got me a Donkey Kong mug. I've got me a cup of coffee in the morning, tea in the afternoon. Lovely. That's how I do it. Yeah, yeah, that's the way to go, isn't it? <clears throat> okay, I'll just start. Uh, <clears throat> Hello, everybody. My name is Scouse Gamer88, and welcome. Welcome to a very um, special interview. I've got with me the. Uh, the composer for um, for rare um, many many of their classic their rare's classic games. Um, obviously, a freelance composer and now film composer, Grant Kirkhope. How are you doing, mate? I'm good. How are you doing? Um, yeah, not too bad. Um, how have you been holding up? All right. I mean, we just got yeah. Like I've just got this, I've got I've had both vaccinations. So is a wife and my son. My daughter's had the first shock. She's six fifteen. So we're getting there now. I feel like you know, but. Oh, yeah. uh, it's been a bit, you know, I guess for everybody, it's been one of those years, right? It's been a bit of a strange thing, hasn't it? Yeah, it has. It's been a bit of an anomaly. Um, they're starting to, um, they're, they're doing age 36 and over now in terms of the vaccine um, over in the UK. So uh, I'm 32 now, so I mean, hopefully I'll be able to have mine um, in due course. Yeah, you, yeah you're nearly there, nearly there, aren't you? I feel like it's, uh, you know... One of those things we're going to tell our, well, tell our kids, my kids will be telling their kids that they went live through the pandemic, right? You know, it's going to be one of those, like, like 100 years ago with the Spanish flu. It's one of those things, isn't it? And um, yeah, yeah, it'll be interesting to um, see how, <clears throat> to see how that um, gets made into a footnote um, in terms of history. It's, um, it's quite, it's quite, um, it's quite surreal. No, definitely. It's like, I think, you know, managed to get through it. I mean, I guess there's a lot of people dead, which is very unfortunate, you know, but. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. Condolences to anyone who's lost any friends and family throughout the pandemic, but um, oh. yeah, hopefully, <clears throat> I mean, hopefully it'll be sorted out soon. But um, yeah, as I said, what um, what I wanted to do, Grant, is basically um, start from the beginning um, in terms of your early life, and um, you know, obviously from there you um, went uh, you. Well, but first you started out in the uh, the music scene, and then obviously in 1995 you uh, went to Rare, and then went on to a um, to become a freelance composer, and now a film composer, which I was uh, quite I was quite interested to uh, know about. But um, as I said, I'm going to uh, start from the beginning. So, um, where exactly um, did your passion for music originate from? I don't really know. I think it's one of those things that you're kind of born with, and I don't think you really understand why what happens. My dad was a massive music fan, right? So. I lived in Edinburgh in Scotland, you know, I was born, uh, and um, he was always playing like, you know, Frank Sinatra, Glenn Miller, all the big band stuff. That was his heroes. So, you know, as a kid, I was exposed to, you know, a ton of Frank Sinatra, a ton of, you know, Glenn Miller, big band stuff, uh, Bert Comfort, um, all the Tommy Dorsey, all the big kind of big bandy guys back in, you know, back in the 50s, I suppose, 50s and 50s. So um, and my mother was a dancer. She danced in the music halls in uh, Edinburgh. Uh, and they met, I don't, I don't know, they met through that, I think. Um, so my dad never played, no one, had never, no one in the family played anything except me, so they, they just loved music, so I guess it kind of rubbed off on me. But I remember when I was like four, we moved to the UK, no, I must have been like six, when we moved to the UK, we moved to, not the UK, we moved to England when I was about five. And I remember them bringing around recorders when I was at school, so he wants to play a recorder. And I just put my hand on because I, I just wanted to do it, I don't know why. I remember it was 15 shillings for a recorder it was, <laughs> so I bought that and then started playing that. And then like, they brought around a cornet when I was like, six or seven uh, in a shopping bag in the, in the school in Nairsborough where I lived and uh, I put my hand up first and got the cornet so I started playing trumpet from that so that was it uh, for me I, that was that me starting off that I, I, you know and I kind of found that I had a bit of a, a natural bent for music I don't really know you know it's one of those things you kind of just pops up you don't realize do you so uh and I started playing guitar like about 12 I was kind of self-taught you know like rock guitar player so um, yeah, yeah, I was uh, self-taught on the guitar as well. Um, I started playing when I was 16. But right. um, yeah, I didn't have uh, things I suppose you didn't care, pick up, especially if the instrument is relatively easy to play. Were there any other um, instruments that you were uh, playing from early on as, a, uh, as opposed to just guitar and trumpet? No, that was it. That uh, was it. Um, were you much of a gamer back then? I mean, um, you know, did you, um, did you ever think um, that you'd like to have aspirations to uh, compose for games or have a career in the gaming industry. But well, you got to think how old I am, right? So there wasn't a lot of games around back then, right? So it wasn't really there when I was a kid. Games didn't come till later. So I remember um, I used to do, I, I got to be a member of the North Yorkshire School Symphony Orchestra, which was kind of the, North Yorkshire's the biggest county in the UK. So it's, that orchestra was like, for me, that was like the LSO. 
So I got into that on trumpet. And I used to, I used to have two courses a, in, a, a year, uh, a week in Easter and a week in summer at, at Scarborough, at the uh, tech college there. So that to me was just amazing. But um, we used to get from one o'clock till six o'clock off in the afternoons to like, you know, dick about and stuff. So I used to, I used to always go down the arcades and Scarborough and just play arcade machines. That, that's all I wanted to do. And everybody else was like, you stupid, they were all walking about on the beach. And I was like, no, I want to be in the arcade. So I used to get, a, I used to add a five pound note to last me the week. Yeah. So uh, I used to just go down and play all the, that no, was 10 pence ago then. So I used to go and play all the, all the arcade, like early Space Invaders, that Boot Hill game, the submarine game with the thing that, you know, the visor used to look through. Um, what else did I play? It, that, that was the arcade. I think it was maybe very early Galaxians, maybe. Or maybe that wasn't quite there yet. Um, yeah. But um, used to play, I used to spend from one o'clock to six o'clock in the, in the afternoon, every day of the week in the arcade, just playing. That's what, that's what I did. Um, yeah, my dad um, used to do that a little bit. He, uh, there was a period when he was working in the Isle of Wight, and um, he said that uh, the one camera that he was obsessed with at that point was Galaxian. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, come on top of that. Um, so, obviously, at that, um, you started out as a, um, a, well, a live musician. You were uh, playing in bands such as uh, Zoot and the Roots and so forth. Um um, what uh, was that the uh, the band that you enjoyed playing in most um, throughout that period? Well, like, I, I, you know, I want had long hair like yourself. I wanted to be in a metal band, right? That's what I wanted to do. And I did. I was playing in metal bands from like sixteen onwards, probably. Um, but um, and I went to yeah, I went to you know, to to the Royal the Cause of Music in Manchester and did a proper music degree, you know, classical trumpet, etc. For four years, like eighty to eighty four. Um, and then I came back home and like was just back on the door because I, I didn't want to get a job right. So I was on the door. So I basically just started playing in bands. But like Zoot and the Roots was a strange thing because I had no interest really in playing for a band like that on trumpet. I was play, I was mostly focused on metal bands. But I was signed, we got signed to a little record label called Power Station Records with a band called Maniacs, which I played for on, on guitar. with one album out. And the guy that ran the label knew I played trumpet and had this band called Zoot and the Roots. So, you know, they want a trumpet player. Do you mind stepping in to help out until they find the real guy? And so me... And my mate, Frank Meisen, who um, was a trombone player, he kind of was a, 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 um, an audio mixer for, you know, he, did, he mixed some of the albums that I played on in the metal bands. He got us both us up in to play trumpet for and, tr and trombone for Zoot and the Roots, like for this thing. And we kind of did it for a little while, thinking we'll eventually quit as if I'm real players. But they never did. So <clears throat> we just kept playing. And also, the alien concept was that we actually got paid for doing gigs. Like when we do metal bands, you never got any money in your pocket, right? It was just like you paid for the van and that was it, right? Because in the roots, you got we got giving them money at the end of the night. We each got a wage. It was like, Christ, this is unbelievable, you know. So, uh, so I played for them for a long time. I've got good, probably seven years. I would have said. And Zoo was well, that kind of band that um, they were massively popular in the UK at the time. Like we played every university. We were a real uni band. And um, we did Saturday Night Live. You know, we did London Palladium with Benny King when he when he had Stand By Me at Number One. We were his backing band and all that stuff like that. We did a lot of stuff. You know, I played on Europe. So Zoo was a popular band, but never quite cracked it through. Record wise, we had one record release, uh, never, and it kind of did all right, but we never got anywhere. And it, and and I, in the end of it, I was getting back into metal bands, so I kind of left, and you know. But then um, after that, because the guy who ran the record label, Kev Nixon, um, who ran Power Station Records, also signed Little Angels, who were quite a big UK rock band, and and um, said, look, we want to get a bit of horn section for one of the, one of the singles called Radical You Lover, and so uh, me and Frank. Did trumpet and trombone for them, and we ended ended up touring with them too. So we did, did a lot of years touring with them. Um, you know, we doing proper massive shows like Plymouth Bon Jovi and you know Wembley Stadium with Brad Adams. You know, kind of and then Bon Jovi six week tour around Europe. I'll sleep when I'm dead. Playing massive arenas that were like ninety thousand seaters, like outdoors, incredible stuff. You know, we also did a Van Halen tour for six weeks around Europe, doing the like, same big arenas you know, and all that. So we did some giant stuff for the Little Angels. Um, but, you know, they'd be on tour. I'd come back and back home to Harrogate and Aresburg, play my local bands again, do my local stuff, playing in pub rock, all that. And then Little Angel split. Uh, and I was kind of stuck just doing me, me um, playing bands, you know, playing local bands, all that kind of stuff. So, um, and then one of my mates of mine called Robin Beanland, who lived in Leeds, uh, he, we were playing in bands together, we were good friends. He, keyboard player was, he announced he got a job. Like, you know, no one I knew got a job. All my mates just played in bands on the door a bit, on in bands, off and on, you know. So um, he said, I've got going to work at Rare. I was like, blimey. So off he went, you know. About a year and a half went by and said, look, Grant, you've been on and off the door for 11 years, because I had. I was 33. 
he said, uh, why don't you try, well, you know, you know, why don't you get a job? I said, well, you know, what can I do? He said, why don't you try to do what I'm doing, write music for video games? And I played tons of games at the time. I was really a big gamer then, you know, like on, the, on Super NES uh, and the original Game Boy. And I said, well, I'll have a go, but, I, you know, I never once thought about being a composer ever, you know. I was terrible at Harmony. Um, so um, I bought, he recommended some gear, I bought an Atari ST, a synth module, a copy of Cubase, and sat in my bedroom in 1994. Or writing tunes that I thought would be appropriate for video games. And I, I sent Rare like five cassette tapes over the course of that 1994. I never got a reply. And then out of the blue, I got a letter saying, please come for an interview. And off I went to Twycross. I got uh, interviewed by Dave Wise. And uh, would you believe that I got the job? So, uh, complete fluke, you know. I was going to, I had no idea that you'd um, supported um, half of those bands. Uh, yeah, 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 we did like Little Angels did probably, but Little Angels could headline the UK in their own right. We did, we did Hamsmith Hoodie and all, all the big, you know, all the big uh, theatre gigs in the UK. But we used to play bigger gigs as the opening act for, we did that, that bunch of so was six weeks. We did um, uh, Brad Adams tour right, right, right around football stadiums in the UK. We did like Wembley Arena, sorry, Wembley Stadium, Cardiff Arms Park, Man City Football Ground. Um, where else did we play in the UK? Birmingham, what was that? Forget. So we did like, you know, but when, that was when Brad Adams was also Milton Keys Bull we did with him. That was when um, Brad Adams had that number one with him, everything I do, do it for you. So he was, he was huge. He was like a gigantic star then. So it was it was us, um, it was ex, us Squeeze, Extreme, mm -hmm. and Brad Adams on the same bill. And that was that was the bands, the all four bands. And then when we did the Bon Jovi tour, it was us and just them, I think. Yeah, I think it was just us and Bon Jovi. Um, you know, and it's good to see all those big bands work, right? You know, and they're and they're all super friendly. And of course, doing the Van Halen tour was fantastic because I've, I've been a guitar player. Like meeting Eddie Van Halen was a massive hero of mine, and he still is. Um, you know, um, to get to meet him was just uh, just amazing. So, you know, it sort of showed me what that side of life was like. Even though we were the opening act, the support band, you still get to see it all. You know, so uh, it was super cool doing those giant gigs. Um, I would suppose that um, Miles Gilderdale and uh, Snake Davis would have similar opinions because, of course, they went on to um, they went on to further success within the music industry yeah. too. Um, when I interviewed Chris Seaver some time ago, he said that you had a few rock and roll stories to tell. Are there any that stand out? There's, you know, some of them you can't really can't really tell. You know, oh, right. um, there was certainly. Um, you got to see because the American bands were very. It's a very different scene in America to the UK. Um, that whole groupy thing. It's not so big in the UK, but it's gigantic in America. You know, so uh, they had, you know they're quite a lot of stories. And like you know, Eddie Van Halen was. I mean, obviously, I know he's just passed away. Was a really, really super nice, genuinely warm person. Like I feel like he's playing sounds that way. It's because his personality. You know, and. For me, get to meet him, and like, you know, I talked to him every day for six weeks. I just, I just tried him my hardest. I thought I might never meet him ever again, so you know, got to know him pretty well, you know. Uh, and I never, never met him again after that. And he gave me a guitar and all that stuff, which is amazing, you know. So um, the story is a little bit kind of, I don't know. I, I don't think I can repeat the one on an interview, really. But there's plenty of uh, nonsense about nonsense you can imagine. <laughs> um, you um, acquired a uh, nickname when you were um, when you were doing your early uh, early music um career uh, when you when you were doing that it was a uh, dog tanyan where where did that nickname originate from so i had this bizarre hairstyle where because i was a metal i had a lot, totally long hair right and when i joined zoo and they were like a soul funk band they didn't like that i had to put the I had to put my hair in a ponytail to, to, to kind of match him with the rest of the lads right you know because they were all sort of super flat top you know so eventually um I decided to, so I put my hand in a ponytail. I said, I went to the barber, I said, right, cut everything off, else completely down to the bone, apart from the ponytail at the back. So he did that. So when I let my hair out, it looked like two dog ears hanging down at the side. It was like a really bad bullet. So there was that awful cartoon called Dog Tanya, which I don't know if you remember, back in the UK years ago. And so they all thought I looked like Dog Tanya, so I got the nickname Dog Tanya. So I got shot to dog after a while, but like, that's why I had the, I had the, the Dog Tanya ears hanging down. Yeah, a bit like that. Yeah, it was like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, so, um, was there any aspect of your uh, early music career that went on to um, influence you as a video game composer? Was there any um, any hint of them? I feel like you know, playing in live live music for like eleven years is fantastic experience because you get to experience so much stuff. Like you play with other bands, other bands play with you, so you get to see loads of people playing. So it's really. It, I feel like it really sort of, sort of um, fleshed out my mind more than just metal and 
I guess, classical music, which was kind of, you know, our film scores even. So, you know, you got to see the different side of it and playing in a kind of soul funk band, that's worked very alien to me in a horn section. Um, but like, it was really, it really, it broadens your mind, right? So I feel like that was, that was a, a good thing to do. Um, yeah, definitely. So um, the um, music industry, um, obviously uh, your part of that faded out, um, Rare Come Calling in 1995, um, obviously, they were um, an established uh, second party developer in Nintendo at the time. Um, you clarified it was uh, Robin Beanland that um, that influenced your uh, decision to go there. Um, what was your uh, first day like at Rare? What were you um, What were you tasked with doing at first? You remember? Well, just being there was super exciting, right? Because Robin had been there a year and a half, so I knew what was going on. And like, just to be amongst that, I like Donkey Kong Country. Two was maybe just about to come out on the SNES, but the you know they made the headline, they made news at ten, getting going to half, getting that forty nine percent bought by Nintendo. You know that was just unheard of. Nintendo never ever bought a Western developer, or even was interested in that. So that was on the news in the UK. It was such a big deal. So I was like super. I couldn't believe I was actually going to be there. You know. So my first day, uh, you get your gear and start to get put it all together. And there was a music block at Rare, and I was there was no space for me in there. So I was in this thing they used to call the chicken shed, which is like a little room next to the canteen. At Rare, uh, and I was in there, this little room. And Dave Weiss came in and said, Right, first job, you're gonna to have to convert my music from the Super NES Donkey Kong Country 2 to work on the original Game Boy. And I was like, All right, you know. So I, I, was, I was using MIDI files and it was, you know, it was all quite friendly. But um, I didn't know, but when it, but it turned out it was just like it was all done in hex, hexadecimal code. So it's just like it's a black screen with white numbers, right? So you type in the first two numbers of the note length, the note, and the second two numbers of the note length. And it's just in columns of notes, right? Just columns like that, like just write it. So you've got to do every note one at a time. And you get three three channels that either can do a note each. And the fourth channel is just a noise channel that uses like sound effects and uh, and uh, wacky noises. So uh, that was a bit of an eye opener. And I, I was like, oh my God, this is, I didn't I had no idea what I was doing. I thought it was just too hard. And Dave was brilliant at it. I had no idea what I was going to do, how I could do it. So he showed me, I was like, all right. And I just sat the rest of the day thinking, I can't do it. I'm not clever enough. So I rang Robin and said, look, you're Robin. I said, I'm going to have to resign. I said, I really honestly can't do it. It's too hard for me. He goes, it's really stupid. He said, look, get day back tomorrow and just tell him you have trouble understanding it and write each step down one at a time. So I rang up Dave the next day. I said, look, Dave, come back, show me again, you know. So he came back and I, I literally did it a fashion, you know, step one, press alt four, press two, do this, press step three. I did it absolutely like that. And then I, and then I got around and then I could do it then. I was slow at the start, but I sort of really enjoyed it in the end. I must admit, I was it, trying to get make the Game Boy sound half decent it's really difficult so um, it's like you know Dave, I thought Dave's music on Donkey Kong Country 2 was fantastic uh, so um, you know I really liked looked up to convert that to uh, Game Boy it was a task but uh, in the end and I sort of halfway doing that it must have been, about, must have been like October November maybe November-ish I got a visit from um, uh, Martin Hollis who was the head of the GoldenEye team and uh, yeah, Graham Norgate who was there at the time of the composer was doing uh, Goldeneye and uh, Blast Court at the same time. So he said, like, he's good, so I'm getting really busy on Blast Court. Can you take over doing Goldeneye? I was like, oh, you're joking. I'd love to take over doing that, you know. So Hollis came to see me. Uh, it was agreed that I'd do Game Boy in the morning and, and Goldeneye in the afternoon. So started doing Goldeneye in that, it might be like November, I think, something like that. And then it went into the next year so at some point. So, you know, doing Goldeneye was amazing. And, you know, so that was like, that was my first proper game, you know, where I wrote my own music. So when Graham did work with Graham as well, you know. So like, uh, yeah, amazing. Yeah, absolutely. I can um, understand. Um, something else I wanted to uh, talk to you in regards to that. You've answered a fair bit of it already, but um, what I wanted to know was, um, obviously, Rare did become quite renowned for um, having the um, a great deal of um, renowned in in-house composers. Obviously, there was yourself, there was Robin Beanland, there was David Wise. What was it like to work with those guys? I mean, from what you've told me so far, it looks like um, it, it sounds like you were all there for you know, when you needed each other. But were there ever any um, instances of what you would um, clash in terms of musical difference or whatnot? Did that did that ever not, come to it? Not really, because the, the, the in Ray you generally got your own game. So there was me, Graham Norgate, Robin Beanland, uh, Evelyn Fisher. And Dave Weiss, that was the five composers, right? So, um, I mean, we usually just got our own game. Me and Graham did Golden together, but we didn't actually work on each other's pieces. We did our own pieces. Um, so, you know, and, and I think Dave at the time was doing, I think he was doing Dream, which became Banjo Kazooie. Uh, yeah. Evelyn was doing, uh, I can't remember what was Evelyn. I forget what Evelyn was doing. Robin was doing the Killer Instinct stuff on the arcade on the arcade machine. 
because he had an arcade machine in his in his office, he had the Mortal Kombat machine in his office, and he was he'd, he'd hook his PC up to the speaker, so he could hear what the Killer Instinct tunes would sound like coming out of the machine to make it sound good. So he, so he could he could hear what it was like. I'd also spent a lot of time playing Mortal Kombat, though, which was pretty cool. Um, so um, yeah, and Graham was doing Blast Call. I think he was also doing that Ken Giffrey baseball on the snares as well at the same. I think Graham's doing that as well. So um, what was Evelyn doing? That's completely blanked on what she was doing. Oh, she was doing Donkey Kong Country 3. That's what she was doing. And when she, she was working on that, because that was because DKC2 would, I was done, you know. So, uh, yeah, so we're all doing our own stuff. So you never really classed, you never worked together. We both did our own stuff. All right. Awesome. Um, yeah, I was in me it's good to uh, know that you have that kind of relationship in terms of that. Um, speaking of Banjo-Kazooie, obviously a lot of um, what was uh, um, intended for that game was reworked into other games, like, for example, Donkey Kong 64 and so forth. Did you feel at that time what, that that was your most prolific period um, in terms of uh, your video, uh, in terms of composing for video games? Because there's so many tracks that um, obviously went into the game, but when was then later reworked into um, Donkey Kong uh, Donkey Kong 64, and I believe Banjo Tsui as well. Yeah, so some of the stuff that got left over from Dream, because Dave left Dream to go off and do uh, Diddy Kong Racing, and I was left to Banjo Kazooie by myself. So that's my first game where I did all the music and all the sound effects. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, but some of the Dream stuff, a lot of it didn't get used because it was an RPG, it didn't really fit. So some of the tunes did turn up in Donkey Kong 64, and they turned up in Viva Pinata as well. Um, but a lot of it just got dumped, because it wasn't wasn't appropriate, wasn't going to fit. Um, so, I don't know about being prolific. I mean, I feel like, when you're a staff composer, it's just it's a job, right? You're just like anybody else at the company. You, you turn up at nine o'clock in the morning, start writing music and finish it for five and go on a BT, you know, and come back the next day, you know. So I think that it's um it got me into the real good habit of having a real regime about writing music. So even to this day, I'll start writing music early in the morning, like eight for eight, eight, eight thirty, eight forty five, and I'll go till like one or two o'clock in the afternoon and I'll probably stop and maybe do a bit at night if I'm busy, you know. So I kind of I like that that the way that worked for me. So you know, you just you know it, you just had to get the work done. It wasn't like it was prolific or not. It was like you had you got this amount of music to write. You got you just got to get on with it and do it. You know, especially when I after after Banjo Kazooie, I was doing Tui and DK sixty four and Perfect Dark at the same time. So that was a real busy year. After that, I think you know doing all those stuff, all that stuff together. So um, you know, you, I mean, I think about me right. I talk fast. I, do, I write fast. Right. I just I just do. So I've never really been that threatened by not making a deadline or, or worrying about getting stuff done. I just do write quickly. Um, it's just the way I am. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally get that. I mean, you've um, you've been thrust into rare. You've um, you've composed for so many games. It's um, it's insane. I mean, um, another thing I wanted to um, address as well was creative freedom. Like um, you mentioned, Perfect Dark, and obviously you did uh, Goldeneye as well. Obviously, Goldeneye, you can tell um, there was a lot of influence from the uh, from prior Bond themes in a lot of the stages. But with Perfect Dark. Um, did you feel as if you had more creative freedom um, composing for a game that had its own cohesive concept as opposed to Goldeneye, which was based on a pre-existing license? Well, I, honestly, I didn't mind the Goldeneye thing. I mean, I loved bon, the Bond theme. To get to use that theme, I just thought it was fantastic. I didn't think for one second it was kind of constrictive. I thought it was, in a way, it was like, how many different ways can I think to use this theme? You know, I used it in lots of different styles, you know. So I didn't really find that with that. I think on Pivot Dark, it just it was just another game, right? Like, you know, you just tried to make it start, fit the action. So at the time, I, was, I loved the X-Files. I loved that kind of Blade Runner-y thing. So that, I, was, I was trying to get that kind of dreamy quality into the game, but along with the action pieces, you know. So, um, and, you know, I think that I feel like, I think, I think when I started at Rare, you know, people are, keep an eye on you a little bit more when you start because they want to make sure you're doing good work. So, but I think as my career through through Rare went, I got left alone more and more and more. And it's, but just like, because they trusted me, right? They felt like I'd written good music and I got trusted for it. So I didn't really get too much pushback from any anybody really after the first little while at Rare. Uh, me and Greg Mayles used to have a laugh about stuff. You know, I used to always say, oh God, here he goes again, you know. You know. But um, I feel like I just, I got left alone quite a bit you know, just to get on with it. And people just trusted that I'd come up with the goods. If they didn't like it, I'd change it. But, you know, it, 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 that didn't happen very often. Um, also, I mean, in, in addition to uh, composing, of course, you uh, also did a bit of voice acting as well. For a fair bit, a fair amount of time, you were basically the voice of Donkey Kong, you know, from Donkey Kong 64 onwards. Um, I'm not sure what the last game was. But, um, yeah, I mean, what, what, was, what was that like, knowing that you were um, now um, voice acting 
really what was one of the most well-known characters in all of gaming. That's a bit crazy. Like I, I just did the voice of Donkey Kong 64 because nobody else wanted to do it. Right. <laughs> Literally, you know, it's like, I just, it was like, well, I'll do it, stuff it. I'll just get it done. And that'll be, you, know, you don't think about it because you haven't got a lot of space for voice samples. It's just like oohs and ahs and getting hit and get hit and all that, you know, a lot and okay and all that that he does, you know, and banana and all that. So I just did it and pitched my voice down, not didn't think anything about it really. And then Nintendo asked for the samples. I was like, all right, I sent the samples across to Nintendo. And I, and I just really didn't think any more about it after that. I didn't realise until later that they'd used it up for umpteen games. I, I really didn't know. So I think that was, you know, it's nice to, it's nice they did it. But I mean, it, it, but in in hindsight, I didn't really try very hard. It was just like, you know, ooh, ah, this and that, you know, I didn't really think much about it. So um, it's bizarre it turned up later in later games, you know. Um, I was going to ask as well, um, in terms of Nintendo, did you ever find out what um, Shigeru Miyamoto's reaction was when he heard that voice for the first time? And really, never had any direct contact with the Nintendo, because like, Tim and Chris Stamper, they ran the company, they, they did all the direct contact, or maybe the heads of the game, like Greg and Mike Hollis, would, would have direct contact with them, but the rest was not so much. Um, so, I have no idea. All right. Um, yeah, I, I was going to ask. Yeah, I must have liked it a bit, because he kept, kept it going for a little while, right? So. Um, yeah, yeah, I suppose so. Um, speaking of the um, the guys around the rare offices, Chris Seaver um, said that he, he pointed out you in, um, in terms of what I'm going to ask. But um, in your opinion, who were the uh, the funniest guys to uh, work with around the rare offices? Well, you know, I spent a lot of time with the Banjo guys, you know, who were the original Donkey Kong Country guys on the SNES, most of them. You know, and we really had a real genuine sense of camaraderie. I think that's why Banjo was so successful and people remember it very fondly because the humor is just the humor that we did ourselves taking the piss out of each other and down, you know shouting down the corridor each other you know what i mean like we're in these these barns all together and like you just just the same old jokes just you know the nicknames and the mucking about like you do just that creates a real team camaraderie you know we spent the day together we went out and drank together on a weekend you know like we just we were together like a lot so and all that sense of humor that we had taking the piss out of each other just bled into the game that kind of say that kind of I kind of call it that kind of Brit Monty Python esque thing that sometimes Americans don't get. I kind of feel like that's in Banjo Kazooie, and it's for that reason that it's there. And I feel like when you when a team really gels together as mates, like we did, like you know, you just you you work better. The game's better for it. Like sometimes when these corporate companies try and stick people together, and the game comes out crap. That's why. You know, I feel like when you got a team like like that that was together for years. It just it's like falling off a log, you know, you just like everyone knows what I was gonna do and it just works great. You know, Robin's a funny guy, Christy was a really funny guy. Um, you know, Steve Mayles, Ed Bryan, who I worked with on Banjo team, the funny the funny guys, you know, Gavin Price. Um, you know, there was a lot of people, you know, I really feel like that that period of rare history, it was like rare against the world. We really felt like we were we were doing well. We, we every game we we brought out in that period of time did really well. We had a magic about us at that point. You know, all the teams were separate. You know, it was a bit, we're all kind of got along together. Uh, I feel like the, the company was well run by the Tampa brothers. It was a family company, you know. Um, so for me personally, it was just, it was to be there at that period of time was unbelievable. I never thought I'd ever want to, never want to leave out there. You know, I really didn't. Um, so uh, it was just a, a magical place to be, like Disney World to me. Um, yeah, I mean, and it definitely shows in the uh, the games that you guys uh, developed for the Nintendo 64, most definitely. Um, after that, however, things change. Um, 2003 comes about, um, Microsoft then buy out Rare for, um, th- I think, $375 million it was, something around that region. Yeah. What was your um, reaction to um, when that first happened? What were your th- first thoughts in regards to it? Well, at the time, I thought it was going to be all right, um, because, you know... Um, Activision had tried to buy us, tried, they couldn't, but at that time they weren't doing so well, they didn't have the money, would you believe? Um, so um, Nintendo, is, sorry, sorry uh, and Nintendo made an offer like just about 80% of the company, and Tim McGriff didn't want that. So Microsoft just walked in at the last minute with a ton of cash, and what, what would you do? You know. So And also Ed Freeze was the uh, head of head of Microsoft Game Studios, and he was a real gamer. We all liked Ed Freeze, you know. Yeah. But unfortunately, just as the deal went down, he quit. So it was like, oh. And then Shane King became head of Microsoft Game Studios. He was a kind of business manager. He wasn't really a, he wasn't a gamer, you know. So that to me sort of spelled problematic. It was like a, a non-gamer who's going to be head of the, it didn't seem right to me. So, I mean, they bought us to provide broad appeal content for the Xbox, the original Xbox. And like we were practically the only studio doing it. And there was no way we were going to produce enough content to get to, to, to amongst 
120 people at Rail, 100 people, whatever it was at the time, we couldn't possibly produce umpteen games for that system. In fact, I think Grab by the Goose was the only one that we got out. Um, you know, so, and I, we got the backlash because all the Nintendo fans sort of didn't like Rare. They hated us because we'd gone, gone, to, gone to Microsoft and all that, you know. So, um, that was a rocky start for definite, you know. Um, and I guess for me, it's all right. It was a rocky start. And I, was, it was, I thought, yeah, it's going to be okay. It kind of, it, it calmed down a bit. But eventually, I just didn't like it anymore and I left. Um, yeah, yeah I, I can understand. Um, I mean, uh, just on that, what is your um, opinion on the current state of Rare? Uh, obviously, they've, um, there was a period in which they um, developed solely, pa- solely party games. Um, I've um, talked, uh, I've witnessed interviews with Kevin Bayliss and uh, Mark Stevenson and so forth. They seem pretty reluctant to talk about that uh, period. But um, since they have um, started uh, improving their... Um, their output, obviously, Sea of Thieves came out, and um, the revamp of Killer Instinct, and so forth. But um, what is your opinion of the company as it um, stands now? Well, you know, I think that you know, I left after Banjo Kazooie nuts and bolts. That was just as the Kinect Sports stuff started. I, I wouldn't like doing that at all. Um, so um, I feel like it's taken Microsoft and Rare a long time to understand each other. And there's not that many people left at Rare that are from my day, really. It's a lot. It's all new, really. Most of it, they're all new guys. There's a few quick kicking around, but there must be like only a handful. Um, like Greg's still there, Robin's still there, I think. Um, Chris Marlowe as well. He's still there, yeah. There's a few kicking around, but not many. Um, you know, but I think Sea of Thieves has done well by the looks of it. I, mean, I must admit, I don't really pay attention that much to what they're getting up to. Um, but um, I just think it's taken a long time for them to get. To, for the Microsoft Rare to get in sync, I think, and that's just that shows you the the guys that left, like me, who were part of the original people, you know, didn't like it, and then you had to get new people in to fill the fill the gaps, and that whole new thing of like getting people to be part of that rare culture. It takes it takes a while, you know. You just can't manufacture teams out of thin air. You can't. Um, so I guess it's taken a bit a bit of a long time, you know. But um, uh, see, things seem to be doing well. I haven't played it. Um, people people that I talk to that play it like it. So I feel like Rez, you know, back on its feet again after all this time. Um, yeah, I mean, he is helping, definitely. Um, so you leave Rare in uh, 2011. You uh, then go on to become a freelance composer. And I had a look at the... Uh, hey, hang on. 2008, I left Rare. 2008, I'm sorry, beg your pardon. All right. um, and I had a look at the um, your CV in terms of uh, freelance games that you've uh, developed. And um, I impressed. Um uh, the first game you worked on um, as a freelancer was obviously Kingdoms of, Kingdoms of Amalur Reckoning. Um, it received a lot of critical acclaim when it first came out uh, before the company folded. But it's since um, gone on to um, establish like, a legacy. Obviously, there was a recent remaster of the game. Um, the director was um, obviously Todd McFarlane of uh, Spawn um, fame, uh, read the, uh, wrote the comic Spawn. What was it like working with him? So, so like... Tom McFarlane and Ari Salvatore, uh, like, well, they were like, uh, like in, a, in an advisory capacity. So Todd would come down to the studio and he would talk to all the artists and talk to them about colours and, you know, and they, they, all, they all absolutely loved him. They thought he was fantastic, like, visionary guy. So it really made them all think about how their art style worked a lot. So, I mean, I had a little bit of interaction with Todd and Ari about on the music side, um, but um, they were mostly dealt with, Ari was mostly with the story and, of course, Todd was mostly with the, with the graphics. So, um, you know, I feel like the artist guys really felt they got something out of it every time he came to talk to them about stuff. He really, he just spot things, go, what about this? What about that? You know, so, um, yeah, he was, he was a really cluding guy, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, he, uh, he comes across as such, to be honest, um, with all the stuff that he's uh, developed. Obviously, he's got his own uh, toy line. Uh, that, that's yeah. uh, immensely successful over the last few years. It's insane. Um, another um, game that you worked on, as a freelancer, was um, you remastered the um, Castle of Illusion soundtrack, right. um, Mickey, um, obviously the Mickey Mouse game. Did you um, work alongside the um, original composer, uh, Shig- Shigenori Kamiya, or did he offer any um, advice in regards to um, the direction of the soundtrack and so forth? No, so like uh, that was Sega Australia. So a mate of mine from from Harrogate in North Yorkshire, uh, Jeremy Taylor or Jesse Cook, Jess Taylor, he went off to work at Sega Australia, and he was he's practically still there now. The the, the, the country's gone bust, and he said to me, "We've got a game here, Grant. I think it'd be great for you." Uh, and so uh, I worked with him. So Jess said, "You know, do you, are you some? I did re- I did remix some of the original music, but also it's got original music in it as well from me." 
So it's kind of a it's kind of a mismatch of bits of you know bit of me, bit of them. So um, yeah, I mean that was fun to work on, you know. Um, and there was plans to do the other two. There's two more, isn't there? Um, Castle of Illusion games, not Castle of Illusion, but it wasn't. There was, there was three Mickey Mouse games, and that wasn't on the Sega, wasn't there originally? World of Illusion. I can't remember what the other one was called. Yeah. No. So the plan was, yeah, the plan was to do all three, but uh, but at the time, the exchange it was awful in Australia, so it, it meant it was it was a really costly to a development team there. So Sega shut it down. So we only got one game out in the end. Oh yeah. Um. Right. Okay. So um, a frequent collaborator that you've um been uh, involved with in terms of your freelance careers, obviously Jeff Knott, um, the two of you worked um, extensively on the Civilization series. What was it like working for him, uh, working with him in comparison to a lot of the other composers that you've um, that you've collaborated with over the years? No, Jeff's a super cool guy and he's very, really talented. Um, but when we did the Civilization games, we got given our own bits. So I was given the Arid Planet, I think, in the first one. I was given the Ice Planet in the second expansion for uh, Rising Tide uh, and for the you know Beyond Earth, uh, and so you just do your own stuff, right? So that's the, that, I've never really I've never actually collaborated with any composer on the same music piece apart from uh, Danny Baranowski when we did um, that game. Uh, I completely forgot what the title is. It's uh, Dungeon of Desktop Dungeons. Yes, yeah, so me and Danny worked on that. So we actually actually worked on each of those pieces. On that game, that's the only time I've ever done that. I've ne- I've always worked on my own stuff. I've never collaborated with anybody else in, in my entire career. Uh, so um, so on the civilization civilization games, we did our own planets, our own bits and pieces. Um, and but and like, I mean, Jeff is a fantastic composer. Uh, Griffin Cohen was the guy that was the kind of the sound design guy who we who kind of coordinated it all. And Griffin's another, Griffin's another really good, cool guy. Uh, and so. Um, yeah, that you know that was a really good experience work, working for Firaxis. I mean, you know, there really was. They're super nice people, and um, they just sort of said, "Write epic, hopeful music, and it's going to be live orchestra." It's like Christ, you know, what what better? Just that's it, right? How how good does it get? You know, so I loved writing that, working for those games. It was brilliant. Um, yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Um, one of the first um, indie games that you um, composed for was a Hat in Time. You were a guest um, composer on that, I believe. I'm not entirely sure what exactly it was. Sorry, but. Um, what uh, before um, developing for ukulele? Um, you know, what was your opinion of the uh, indie gaming scene at that time? And did you um, did you look at that um, composing for that game? Obviously, it was a three D platformer, very reminiscent of what came out on the Nintendo sixty four. Um, did you? Um, was there a, a sense of fondness uh, composing for that game as it harkened back to that era? I liked the indie scene. I really liked it a lot. Like it really, I was in that period of time where I was, I was the corporate thing was getting me down a little bit. Uh, and um, I went to GDC a lot of time. Danny Banner said to me, "Come to the, come to the GDC part, come to the indie part of it." Um, the first couple of days, so I started, I started doing that every year, and I liked it because it's like it reminded me of the of the guys at Rare when we first started back then. The, the guys who'd been sat in the bedroom working on assembler, working on the Spectrum, you know, just doing it for the love of it, right? The indie guys were that people all over again, starting again with the kind of sat in the bedrooms making the game, and I liked that. It, 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 I kind of feel like you get an awful lot of creativity. From people just sat in the bedrooms doing stuff, you know. It's just they just do. They do, they do they, no one's telling them what to do. They do what they want, and it comes out. And they get these quirky games that are really cra- fantastic, you know. Um, where well, sometimes you get to the corporate world, it gets it gets all like focus group tested and all. It does it going to is it going to appeal to the right eight bra- and all that nonsense that goes on. And I kind of feel like half the time it ends up watering down the game because you end up yeah. making games by committee, where it's all kind of it just comes out in this kind of lukewarm game that everybody sort of likes a bit, you know. Where when you get a game that's super, it's really supremely focused. It lives or dies. If it lives, it's a it's a, it's a really it's a great game, right? So you hit you get it right. So I like that indie part of it. So working Hat and Time, Hat and Time guys. I only did a little bit for them. Like I did, I did a two versions of the of the main theme. Was that it? I think that was it. Yeah, I wrote two pieces for them in the end. I was supposed to write more than that, but it kind of fell apart. Fell apart a little bit. Um. So um. So really. I didn't have a lot of contact with them. It didn't really, I, so it was really quick, super thing. So I, I, I guess it wasn't a really fair representation of what it was like working for an indie guy. Oh, but um, I mean, as you say, um, indie, um, at the core of indie development, um, obviously creative freedom. Um, you've emphasised the importance of that in our degree. Um, but uh, on the opposite end, at the opposite end of the spectrum, you then later um, 
um, composed for um, Nintendo again. You um, did Mario and Rabbit's Kingdom Battle. Um, you talked about um, how at Rare you didn't really have any first con- first um, contact with uh, Nintendo, but um, was it different at that time? What, for Mario? Um, yeah, how Mario and Rabbit's, did you have yeah. any direct yeah, because so, 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 that's an Ubisoft game, right? Ubisoft did most all the contact with Nintendo. I never really talked to them directly. Um, so, um, um, but you know, they had, they had to okay some stuff that I did. You know, I, to, I redid that the, the the castle theme from uh, Super Mario sixty four uh, for Mario Rabbids, and so they had to they had to vet that. I had a couple of little jingles of the original uh, uh, Mario jingles. Um, so, um, and it was nice to know that they approved. You know, and it all went down well. Um, you know, if someone had told me in 1995 I'd work on a Mario game, for God's sake, I'd never have believed it. I mean, that's just unbelievably ridiculous. I mean, I think I'm the, West, I'm the first Western composer to ever work, work on a Mario game, which was like, you know, at the time I thought about it, and it's super, I tried not to think about it because it's super scary. I'm thinking that I'm bloody hell, if I make a mess of this, it's going to be a disaster, you know. Um, so um, that was, you know, that was equal parts scary, equal parts amazing to get to do that. Um, and obviously, you know, working with David Soliani and, and uh, Romain Brio, who's the audio director there, um, uh, was fantastic fun. I mean, David is still friends to this day and plenty of other members of the team as well. Um, so that was very special to get to do that. Um, yeah, yeah, I would imagine so. Um, something else that um, I would imagine was pretty special for you to work on. Most recently, you composed for um, World of Warcraft Shadowlands, the expansion. Right. I mean, I'd, uh, I was well. I suppose um, in terms of um, composing for that kind of game, obviously, uh, Kingdoms of Amalur springs to mind. But um, um, had you been a fan of the series in any capacity before you'd um, composed for Warcraft? Um, or was it was it um, was it different to um, any other kind of experience that you have in, uh, have had in the terms of composing for games? Oh my god, I was a massive Warcraft player when I was at Rare. I mean, for God's sake, me and Chris Seaver used to spend, you know, our lives buried in World of Warcraft. So <laughs> we used to play Star Wars Galaxies before that, and then he switched to Warcraft, and I switched after because you, you should try it, it's great. So I switched to that. And like, you know, I feel like I was close to divorce from the wife. I spent so much time <laughs> playing World of Warcraft. Um, she was used to go, for God's sake, just, I used to have to dash back from Rare at five because I was in I was in a guild that was in the, based in Europe. So they were an hour ahead of us. So to, they, they were online at seven to, be, to do the big dungeons. I had to get there at six because an hour behind, you know. So I had to dash back from Rare, have me tea, try and get the kids to bed, get get online for six o'clock to, to ready for the big raid. And my wife was like, you know, bloody Christ, you're not the... <laughs> Will you stop playing that bloody game? So, oh yeah, I mean, like, absolutely loved World of Warcraft. I mean, I, did all, I played it right up until, I think, Cataclysm. I think I got as far as Cataclysm, and I think I played quite a bit of that, and I stopped just because I got busy. Um, and so when I got the call from Derek Duke at uh, Blizzard to say, we'd like to come work on Shadowlands, I just couldn't believe it. Like, you know, for me to get even one piece of music in that game was just, like, bucket list for me, you know, completely. I couldn't believe it. And, and also, the Warcraft music is always super high quality. They always hired tons of really great composers. Like Neil Acree's done it for years, he's brilliant, you know. And when I did it with David Arkenstone and uh, Jeff Lefkowitz, who's a staff member there, is a, a young guy who's really brilliant. Um, me, I know somebody, God, I'm forgetting some, the other person. Well, my memory's getting terrible. Anyway, so, but like, absolutely fantastic. You know, I got to do what, Revendreth, uh, Maldraxxus area, uh, San Primus, uh, what else did I do? Uh, Cathalnathria. You know, and, and like, they, they were super nice to me. Um, they were the nicest bunch of people. I guess they've, they've done it with composers so many times. They know how to handle composers, and they've got they sent you tons of great information about what you want to write, and sent you lots of artwork and bits and pieces so you could see it, and little videos. You see, you just completely got it. It was so slick, it was amazing. But we were due to record at uh, Skywalker Ranch uh, last March, when, you know, which I would have thought, Christ, I'm going, I'm going to Skywalker Ranch. To, I couldn't believe it, like to recover, to recover the live orchestra. But that was just as COVID hit that March, so we couldn't go. So I was like, oh. But, um, but we recorded in uh, Aust- remotely in Australia, so we were, we were in, in America here, and they were they were playing in Australia. We were monitoring it online, so uh, turned out great though. Turned out brilliant. So, you know, that was a real, you know, to get to do Mario and Super Smash Brothers tune and World of Warcraft. You know, bloody hell, it's getting a bit like I can't believe I've, I've, I can't believe I get asked to do these things. It's amazing. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, to be um, to be associated with the uh, the composers of Warcraft as well. I mean, Warcraft 3 is one of my favourite soundtracks of all time. So um, yeah. imagine how um, exhilarating it was to have that um, on the amount as well. So um, 
after, so before which um the obviously you then um go on the uh, well a journey of freelance days you then uh, go on to uh, compose for a ukulele um obviously Playto- platonic games founded many of them um, all rare's old alumni um are reunited the likes of uh, chris sutherland who was the director uh, kevin bayless mark stevenson and obviously yourself david wise steve beck you know they're all back but um what was it? What was it like working on the ukulele and um, you know, uh, re- um, and co- coming back to uh, to working with them? Um, a lot of the old rare alumni. Was there um, obviously was there the same kind of uh, camaraderie that you were talking about as you were or um, working with rare back in the day? Oh, totally. It was it was, it was like banjo two years wasn't it? Yesterday, and ukulele was the, was the day. It was like it was just like a day apart. Like it felt like that, even though it was like eighteen years or whatever it was. You know. Um, it was exactly the same, like the same piss taking, the same name calling, nothing had changed. It was, that, it was just, like, just like back at rare. So it was totally brilliant to be working with those guys again. It, we had tons of fun doing it. Me and Steve Mills did quite a lot of interviews for it and stuff and went to E3 a couple of times. Andy Robinson as well. Uh, uh, you know, so like, I'm a guy back with Gavin Price. Like, it was just like the old days. It was, you know, brilliant. It's like putting on your favourite pair of slippers. It was just like that. Yeah, I'd imagine that camaraderie um, helped to relieve the pressure of the fact that uh, ukulele took so long to get out as well. You know, that that thing with indie guys happens every time. They always go, we're going to make it in six months. It takes them four years. Like, because you, you just forget that making games is bloody hard, right? Mm-hmm. And also, it, you Platonic guys got a little bit of stick for, like, the whole thing about the you, for going from the uh, Wii U to the, Switch, to, the, to the Switch and not getting it out on the Wii U, right? And, like, that really wasn't their fault. Um, and but they took stick for it, and they couldn't say what the reason was. And I guess we can't really say the reason till this day. But there's a big, massive reason why they couldn't get it out on the Wii U, and it wasn't genuinely not their fault. So people, so the Switch guys had to wait an extra year. And I feel like it's worth it then because I think the best version of the game is on the Switch. Um, you know, I mean that game sold well over a million copies, which is fantastic for a, for a first indie game. Blimey, it's amazing. Um, so um, it's probably done two million now. I don't know. Um, so. Yeah, so it, that was slightly unfortunate. Um, and I think when it came out, people forgot what a TV platform was like because it'd been a long time since it'd been outright. You know, you do get lost in the game. You do wonder where you're supposed to be going. That's part of the beauty of it, right? You don't have to have a signpost saying, go here, go there, because that takes all the glory out of it. So I think people have forgotten about that. And I, keep, I kind of feel like it got, some people didn't like it for that reason, but they'd, they'd just forgotten that a TV platformer, like, you know, being in Banjo Kazooie or Banjo Tooie in Pterodactyl Land, you're like, I, don't, I, I used to forget where I was supposed to be going, you know? That's that's a feeding platform. You get lost in it, you gotta find your way, you know. So um, yeah, I mean um, maybe ukulele and the impossible layer. When that first when that came out, maybe that was um maybe that helped to accommodate for the other uh, people who um who the gamers who felt that way about their not being you know, having your hands held constantly in regard yeah. to you know as them going through a 3D platformer. But um what I was gonna ask as well, because you've composed for a uh, smash. Would you like to see Yuka and Laylee in Smash at one point? Well, that, that, that'd be amazing, wouldn't it? I, got, I mean, I don't know about how that works, but that would be fantastic. Yeah, be awesome. Well, they'd be, you know what? If they can uh, do move sets for Banjo and Kazooie, I'm sure they'd pro- probably be able to do it for Yuka and Laylee. Definitely. Yeah. Um, so. Sure. Oh yeah, definitely. So um, after uh, so something else that you've uh, branched into over the last few years, um, you know. In addition to uh, composing for video games, you now also compose for films. Um, what um, made you come to the decision to branch out into composing for films as well? I've always wanted to compose for movies, always, 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 always. That's I, you know I've, I've wanted to do that for a long time. It just gets it's just found an opportunity, right? I mean, part of the reason me, me moving to LA was for that reason to try and get into some movie stuff. You know, I want to do I want to do everything. I want to I want to do from mobile phones to movies. I want to do the whole lot. I want to do everything in between, whatever that is. Um, I feel like I like because I, like, I like the variety. It's good fun, and movies are different. And you know, because you, you get that thing where you get to write music for the scene and sculpt it exactly to the action, right? So you get to the right. So sometimes in games you can't do that because they're interactive, you know, by, by by nature. So it's nice to have a chance to do stuff where you can completely sculpt it and make it completely right. Like I did that little short, The Ron Rock, which is on YouTube, and that was directed by Mike Kaywood. And Mike Kaywood was, was one of the guys from Rare who worked on Cameo. So me and Mike didn't really know each other at Rare, but bizarrely enough, we met up in in LA and went, oh my God, you know, I realized we, we kind of knew each other from Rare and he was doing this little indie movie, that, this kind of, um, this little short animation, which is super high quality. Um, it got to the last 96 for the Oscar nomination this year, which was incredible. Um, you know, um, so did that for him, so that was great fun to do. 
Um, and I've been working on a couple of indie movies, one called Shadows, which is nearly out, and one called The Hand, which should be out later this year. Uh, and, I'm, I'm, and I've just done this comedy for um, James. Oh, God, I've, I've, every time I talk about this guy, I forget his second name. Let me just type it into my bloody thing now, and I'll tell you what his name is. It's Woodhouse, isn't it? James, James Miskell. Right, so he's... He did a movie a, couple, a few years ago called uh, Going, for, Going for Golden Eye, which is a, it's a, it's a Northerners Yorkshire-based comedy about um, indie movie about a, a, a fictitious Golden Eye tournament, and, it, and he's just made the sequel. It's called Bring Back Golden Eye. So I've done the, the score for the sequel. It's, it's a funny movie. There's the tournament's back on again. He's got this crazy lead character. It's, you know, it's a, it's a good Northern comedy. So it should be out later this year. I've just, I've just done that. It's been great fun. I wrote all kinds of music for that, just wacky stuff and some Banjo Kazooie, some some golden eye style, some perfect dark style, like all mixed together and the whole thing. So it's been good fun to do that. So um no, I love doing movies. I, I'm I'm I really I'm seriously chasing movies. But it's hard because I live in LA and there's there's a lot of there's a gazillion fantastic composers out there, you know. So uh, yeah. I'm just trying to get I'm trying to do more. Um yeah definitely I mean in terms of I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to catch that at some point because I love like British um cult comedies uh, with Mel and I being one of my favorites I love that film. Right. Um, um, yeah, in terms of composing for films, were there any um, film composers that you um, that you t- t- take inspiration from at all? I think through my life, it's always been John Williams for definite, because he's just even you know I guess every composer is going to say that because he's he's just unbelievably amazing. Um, I feel like if I had one percent of visibility, I'd be a happy man. You know what I mean? Um, but like, um, but like at the Marauders, I was a big Danny Elfman fan too. Definitely, like that whole but that, that first Batman score blew my balls off completely. I couldn't believe how good that was. That was the first orchestral score I ever bought. Um, by Danny Elfman, that theme's amazing. Um, so yeah, definitely Danny Elfman. But I think John Williams all my life for definitely. Yeah. Oh yeah, um, yeah. I mean, you spoke about the Wrong Rock earlier. We uh, spoke on Twitter some time ago about the Wrong Rock. Um, you linked me to it. Um, I thought the uh, the film was absolutely amazing. Strong Disney vibes about it. Um, mm-hmm. in terms of that, um. Because you've composed for The Wrong Rock, and obviously, as we talked about earlier, you've composed for Castle of Illusion. Would you like to um, compose on a full-fledged Disney film at, at some point one day? Oh, God, that would be unbelievable. Like, I'd, I'd, I'd kill for that opportunity. Um, I really would. Like, you know, I've I've, 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 I've I've pitched for a ton of Disney cartoons. I just haven't got any of them. I mean, I've t- done so, you would believe, I've probably done 20. Um, I'd send them, send them a reel. They, send, they would send you a little animation. You score it, send it back. I haven't got any of those. Um I, I, you know, to compose for any of the, the big boys like that would be my absolute dream. Yeah. Um, one of the um the biggest um projects that you're currently working on is the uh, the film The King's Daughter that's um slated for uh, release later on in the year. Um, do you think that that um that film could possibly be an Oscar contender? Well, that movie, right? It's such a bizarre thing. That movie, we finished it like what four years ago or three years ago, something something like that. Um, and there's something going wrong with it somewhere amongst the, uh, the administration of it. There's, there's, there's some kind of fight over the money, so it just hasn't come out yet. And it's got Pierce Brosnan in it. It's like it's not. It's not got. You know, it's a forty million dollar movie. It's filmed at the Palace of Versailles in France. Like it's a big deal. You know. Um, so William Hurt's in it. At K. S. Godelario, who is the she's the the female lead in uh, the Last Pirates of the Caribbean movie. Like she's in Major Winner. Like it's got a lot of big stars in it. Like you know, it's a proper full fledged movie. And the three composers did it. We did it three. three Guys did it together, me and uh, Joseph Metcalf, and not Metcalf, Joseph, oh, God, I forgot his name, jo- John Coda and Joseph, oh, Christ almighty, my, I tell you what, my memory, I'm just getting older, I forgot his, I think it is Metcalf, anyway, um, you know, we did it, we did it together, um, you know, so when it comes out, I really don't know, there's some Chinese money in it, and there's some like LA money in it, and it's like there's just some disagreement somewhere, they just sat on getting the, dis- the distribution right, it's a full but fledged big movie, you know what I mean? So, fingers crossed. Yeah, fingers crossed, definitely. I've just thought on that. That is a mad how that's worked around in a roundabout way. You composed for Goldeneye, and now you uh-huh. compose him for a film with Pierce Brosnan in it. And that was, it was so funny, like, doing, doing the scenes that I did, like, composing with and Pierce Brosnan. There. It's, like, so bizarre, you know, that, that, that I'm doing that, and he's, he's in goal. It's crazy. Actually, we actually met him once. Actually, we, we got invited down to this film set when we did when they did Goldeneye. He falls on the team. They got invited down to to the watching them filming. I think it was Goldeneye actually, and then we, we'd finished that. Oh, we we nearly finished Goldeneye. It was so late, and we got invited down again to the next one. I think it's the world is not enough. Is it? Is that the next one? I get. Um, I think it, 
I'm on an advertise was the next one, I think, and then, well, there's not enough. I believe it was. Right. Well, but the one, well, the one, uh, the one we were going to invite down was that I think it's well, well, it's not enough because one Elliot Carver was he's the the media mogul. Because I remember that that big skyscraper set up that you fall that they fall down when when they him, you know that and that and we saw the the motorbike scene. There's a scene they were filming the scene where um, he's on that BMW bike and he slides it all on the ground and the helicopter's there and he gets off it and throws a rope into the helicopter. And it blows up and all that, and he jumps down the well. Just that, that's the scene we saw filming, which is amazing to see him doing it, you know. But it's a little bit, um, it sort of shatters it all because obviously he's on the bike, the bike on its side, it's on a bit, it's on, on, on rollers. They pull it along the ground, as, so he's just, he's just sat on it as they pull it along the ground. And the helicopter is just a bare shell, nothing, there's just nothing in it. So they, they, add the, the cop, they add the rotor blades and the people in it later. There's nobody, it's just an empty shell of a helicopter. And they pull him along the ground, he gets up. Throws a rope, doesn't go anywhere, anywhere near the helicopter. He just throws it, and then he just jumps down the well, which is just a, a, a few feet deep, well, a couple of feet deep, right? And just, so it kind of shatters the illusion a little bit when you see it all. We had a brief chat with him after that, so it's nice to sort of, it was nice to sort of say hello, shake his hand, and all that, you know, about that, you know. But it was cool to see it. It is cool the way uh, you guys um, who have uh, quite fond memories of the James Bond franchise as well. David Doak said as much um, when he gave an, he, he's a lecturer now. He gave an interview at his university, like a um, a presentation, and he um, he commented on uh, how how passionate he had been about the series and so forth. Yeah, I must admit, I think it was. I think there's a documentary about to come out about that thing, about that thing actually from an Australian guy. Uh, and it's it's Andrew Drew. It's, it's it's a really in depth thing. And interviewed a lot of people. All of us, you know, kind of think it's really super in depth thing. And like, you know, realizing that none of us have made a game before on that team, apart from maybe one person. I think I think Martin maybe had. Uh, like, that's you know, and the fact that we but we're all Bond fans. Like, you know, we all love James Bond, I and mean, I still to this day I loved the Bond movies. I mean, look, I can't, they're fantastic, right? I guess it's a certain age group. Um, you know, so it was bizarre that we'd all love Bond and we all had made a game before to do, to make, and we made GoldenEye, like it's crazy really. And you sort of, sometimes you don't realise how big an influence that game was, you kind of forget about it a little bit, and then you see a documentary about it, people talking about it, you go, bloody hell, like, you know, it was pretty revolutionary at the time, you know, you just don't realise it. So that was, um, I don't know, Doki just, just, just talks these days, and it's, it's got us all back together a little bit, I've got to say. Um, so, um, yeah, just amazing to do that. That's awesome, man. Um, just got a couple of uh, closing questions then for you now. Um, what are you most proud of throughout your career? That's a hard question, right? Because I get asked that a lot. And like, I'm, I've been very lucky to work on lots of great games. I've, I've only worked on one game I haven't really liked. Um, I've, every other game I've been really happy to work on. Um, so, you know, I've got a big soft spot for Banjo Kazooie, of course. That was my first game by myself. You know, all the music, all the sound effects, you know, kind of thing. Um, you know, doing Viva Pinata, my first game of live orchestra, and I got a BAFTA nomination for that game, which was amazing for the score, which is incredible. I didn't win it, but I got nominated, you know. And doing Kings of Amber was amazing because that's the first big kind of big full scale like orchestra thing where I got to really go for it, you know. And I did I wasn't sure I could do it, you know, so I kind of proved myself to myself that I could do that kind of giant score. And, you know, and get doing civilization was great for the big stuff, but doing Mario Rabbids was amazing because it's Mario, for God's sake. You know, I can't I actually got to work with them on a Mario game, which just a, it just once in a lifetime experience, right? It's amazing. Um, so I guess there may be the moments, but it's hard to pick things out, really. Is um, yeah, I mean, I can imagine, but um, um, so do you um, have any advice for any um, either aspiring games developers or games composers, film composers who may be watching this right now? Don't sit in your bedroom just making stuff and expect people to find it, and you put it on a YouTube somewhere and hope they're not going to find it, right? And that's not going to happen, or it's very unlikely. Um, you need to get yourself into a space, wherever that is, where people are like you are like-minded who make games. If that's game jams or go to conventions or whatever it is, you've got to meet fellow game makers. This is for composers or any kind of game dev guy. You've got to get yourself in a space where what you've made, you can show it to somebody else who goes, oh, I like that. Why don't you come with me? Whatever that is. Right? You know, especially for composers, just bugging it up on a, on a website, your own website or on YouTube, no one's going to hear it. Everyone's, there's a gazillion people doing that. You've got to meet some, you've got to get your networking sorted out. Having the, the talents, only half the battle. The other half of the battle is get is connecting with people. And none of us like doing it. It's difficult, it's awkward. I know it is, I, I find it hard. Um, but that networking thing, the people you know, is that's going to get you the work. So you have to get into that place, wherever it is, these people, these games developers are hiding. You go, go to conventions, whatever it is, you know, meet fellow game makers. That's the only way to do it. Yeah, you know, 
know, I probably could take a lesson from that because um, ever since the uh, the COVID pandemic started, um, although I do attend a lot of expos, uh, maybe I don't attend enough. But yeah, it's um, it's definitely a point. I'm um, I'm going to have to keep that in mind, uh, definitely. But um, last sorry, question. It's, sorry, it really is the only way you've got to meet people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that, I agree. I can take that lesson. Um, last question, and how would you like to be remembered? I always joke that. No matter how much music I write, good or bad, I'm always going to be remembered for the Donkey Kong rap. <laughs> <You know? laughs> how much? I know. So I feel like on my gravestone, it's going to say, he allows the body of Grant Kirk up, he wrote the Donkey Kong rap. <laughs> uh, well, speaking of which, um, I wanted to close out by saying, my uh, one of my fondest memories of um, Donkey Kong 64 is uh, I was about um, 10, 11 years old, and I put it on in the living room, you know, just thinking I was uh, going to spend a few hours um, just playing and not having a care in the world. But my mum and my brother were in the room at the same time, right? right. Of course, you know what? I'll let the uh, the Donkey Kong rap play, you know. Um, it's a bit of uh, fun. Um, I was uh, singing along to it. And then my mum and my brother started singing along to it as well. And after, <laughs> after, after about two minutes, after <laughs> Two minutes I wanted to turn the bloody cuts off. <laughs> <I'm not laughs> listening to them singing. But <laughs> um, yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, um they enjoyed it and uh, I ended up playing the game anyway for a good few hours there. But um that is one of the most awkward and one one of the most memorable um memories that I've gotten one of the most happiest memories I've got in my life. And you ended up uh, you you made that for me really, so I just wanted to say thank you. No, you know what? I do hear little stories like that now, now and again. You know, I do get some sad emails from people who, who, you know, their, their parents have passed away, and they, and they, they remember, you know, sitting in, sitting with the mum in bed playing Banjo Kazooie, and whenever they play the game, it brings it back about the mother. You know, and I really, you know, that's one of those things that I feel like video games really do bring people together. Like, you know, it's, I feel like in this in this age in this age that we're in now, that people your age are younger than you, you know. Video games is their lifeblood, right? For, for a lot of people, my son's only played played video games forever. It's, he only listen, that's only does in his life. That's video games apart from school, you know. Um, I feel like they really do bring people together. You get, you get these the entire communities people never met online, but meet online and they get the friends online and they meet up eventually, and all that stuff happens, you know. And like I think that's such a special thing. And you know, I do get, get that kind of email now and then where it's you know it's very sad, but to be a little part of people's lives like that, me personally, like a little part of someone's lives, just is the best feeling ever. It's it's so, I kind of feel that's what it's all about. Regardless of all the other nonsense that goes on, those little little nuggets of things like that make it make it so special to be involved in this industry. Um, yeah, I agree. I mean, for all the times that our mums and dads told us that we play video games too much, at the end of the day, it, you're right, it does bring people together, even now more so than ever um, with the advent of uh, online gaming and so forth. But um, it is a uh, special medium, and um, that is just one of the one of the very main reasons for that, I think. Definitely. Yeah, I really, really believe that. I know, bro. Yeah. Um, anyway, thanks for um, thanks for your time. Anyway, Grant, and I uh, hope um, things are going well at your end. Well, all right so far. I hope, hope you're well too, Steve. So thanks for thanks for wanting to talk to me. It's been a good laugh and uh, good luck and everything. Yeah. Good luck to you too, man. All right. See you after, Thanks, mate. Steve. Bye. 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 Bye.